resurrection. Why is it important? Before we get into that, let's just look at what we've studied so far and what we're still going to be looking at. Next week, it's going to be the last of the series of just plain Bible prophecy, looking at the millennium and beyond. What will that 1,000-year reign of Jesus be like? You and I will be a part of that. We'll come back with Jesus, and we will rule and reign with him. And so we'll be looking at that. Then beyond that point, we go into that eternal bliss. And what does the Bible have to say about that? Certainly we cannot comprehend all the meaning that the Lord has in store for us. And eventually, of course, we'll get into the book of Revelation in two weeks, the Lord willing. But tonight, looking at the bodily resurrection. And as we look at that, it's certainly good news, right? It gives us great hope. And one day we'll have total victory over death. There will be no more death as far as you and I are concerned. Now, let me ask this question. Is the resurrection important? What does the Bible teach about the resurrection? We'll be looking at that this evening. Is there more than just one resurrection? We've already talked about that, but we'll review that this evening. And if so, what are they? And when will they take place? So looking at the resurrection, why is the resurrection important? It's important because it vindicated Christ's deity. Paul said when he wrote to the Romans, Jesus, Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus was, and he declared, the, he declared to be the Son of God with power according to spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So that was the absolute proof that Jesus was who he claimed to be. That confirmed his deity because no one had ever been resurrected from the dead like Jesus. And so that vindicated his claim. It also demonstrates the power of God because Matthew wrote, regarding the resurrection, Jesus said to the unbelieving Sadducees, you know not the power of God. Because the Sadducees denied the doctrine of the resurrection. So therefore, they didn't know the power of God. Furthermore, it's important because it made justification for us possible. John the Apostle said these words, Jesus, because of his sacrifice, became a sin offering and our propitiation, because he wrote there in 1 John 2, 2, for he himself, that is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours only, but also for the whole world. Now that term propitiation is a word that we don't hear too much about today, but it basically meant it satisfied God's demand regarding sin. It met all the requirements because it was a substitutionary atonement where Jesus died on our, on our behalf. Also, the resurrection made the new birth possible. Peter said these words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us, or born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus had not come and been resurrected, we would have no hope, no hope whatsoever. Also, furthermore, it's important because one must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be saved. Did you realize that? What we we're told in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. So that's all part of the requirement to be saved believing in the resurrection. Also, it's important because it brings conviction upon the unbeliever. So therefore, we need to talk about the resurrection. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when he would come, he would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father through the resurrection and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. According to that very first prophecy concerning Jesus back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we're told, as God announced to Adam and Eve, that one day Satan would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman 
would bruise his head, a fatal blow. So Satan was only able to bruise the foot of Jesus, but Jesus bruised Satan's head. One day we'll see that for sure. Now, what does the Bible say about the resurrection? Well, let's look at it. First of all, we need to know the scriptures. In that regard, recall when Jesus had a conversation with the Sadducees. They were the religious sect that did not believe in miracles. They didn't believe in angels. They did not believe in the resurrection or life after death. And so the Sadducees came to Jesus, and they posed to Jesus this scenario when they cited the story of a woman who married a man who later died. And in accordance with the Leverite law, there in Deuteronomy chapter 25, her husband's brother took her as his wife in order to perpetuate the dead brother's line, which was the requirement based upon the law. But he too died shortly thereafter. This happened after seven brothers. So then they came with this question. At the resurrection, if you say there is a resurrection, then whose wife, whose wife will these seven have, you know, since they all they were married to her? I'm thinking if that being the case, I would not want to have been one of her husbands. <laughs> but uh, and nonetheless, what did Jesus say? He says, your mistake is that you do not know the scriptures and you do not know the power of God. And I think that's the situation with most people when there are skeptics, when they argue. It comes down to this. They don't know the scriptures. They think they do. They think they have the answers. For Jesus went on to say, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now, as to whether there is a resurrection of the dead, haven't you ever read about this in the scriptures? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, so he is the God of the living and not the dead. So here are the Sadducees, who were supposed to be well-schooled in the Old Testament scriptures, and yet they denied the very facts that are laid so clearly out in that word. Now Jesus, we know, was raised from the dead according to scriptures. Paul wrote, he wrote to the Corinthians, he said this, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to scriptures. Notice how condensed, really, the gospel is there. Jesus died for sin, according to the scriptures. And he always used the word of God to back up his statements. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scripture. So he used the biblical basis for his teaching. But the only scriptures that existed when Jesus was raised from the dead are those found in the Old Testament. So, tell you what, we'll begin in the Old Testament with perhaps the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. A book that perhaps is older than the flood. Now, some believe the book of Job may be older than the flood. Why? Because Job doesn't mention several things such as Moses, the Exodus, the Ten Commandments. So some think he probably wrote before these things actually happened. We know that Job had ten children, and they were all killed. Later, Job had ten more children. After that, we're told that Job lived another 140 years. In all probability, he lived maybe three to 400 years or more. Now, why is that important? Well, people only lived that long before the flood. So we kind of conclude that Job lived before the flood, and perhaps his book, as far as the date of writing is concerned, is the oldest book of writing in the Bible. However, as ancient and way back as Job was, he believed in the resurrection of the body. He said this, After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. We know that Job went through a horrendous trial. He lost his family, he lost his wealth, even lost his health. And so he was really taken to the almost the end of things. And certainly being taken to that point, he was looking forward to the resurrection. 
And I think so many times the Lord allows us to get to that point of desperation so that we would understand what is really important in life, looking for that ultimate day when the Lord would come and raise us up. Job went on to say, even though my body is destroyed, I will see God in my flesh. Now that's interesting. Even though my body, his fleshly body is destroyed, I will see God in my flesh. How's that going to happen? Well, we'll see perhaps more of this later on. Abraham believed in the resurrection of the body. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac. So we're told that Abraham took his servants, a knife, firewood, and went to Mount Moriah to do it. He planned to build an altar, kill Isaac, and burn his body. And there would be nothing left of but ashes. But after three days of travel, they arrived at their destination. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and notice, we will come back to you. Now the question is often asked, if Abraham intended to kill Isaac and burn his body, why did Abraham tell his servants that Isaac would come back with him? Interesting. Well, we go to the New Testament, and Paul gives us the answer. He said, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that, God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figuratively sense. So even Abraham believed. So this doctrine of the resurrection certainly is not something that's new, at least as far as the New Testament is concerned. It goes way back at the beginning, so to speak. So Abraham believed God's promises. You know, that is such an important place to be, to be finally brought to the place where you live and you walk in the truth of God's word. Twice, John writing to his children, as he called them there, and he's short little epistles. He says, I rejoice greatly that I hear my children are walking in the truth. And I pray for that a lot for people, that they will learn to walk in truth because, you know, the world is constantly trying to reform our mind and our thoughts and how we need to be walking in that truth of God's word and having the truth of God's word coming into our thoughts before the world has its opportunity to do the same. We need to be living and walking in the truth of God's word so that when we see the word of God planted into our thoughts, then we'll recognize the, the lies that come in, right? It's like trying to identify counterfeit, counterfeit money. If you know the real thing, then you'll quickly identify something as being unreal or counterfeit. And that's why we need to have the word of God firmly planted into our hearts and coming into our thoughts continually. Now, Abraham believed God would raise up Isaac with a new body because God told Abraham that he would have seed or descendants that would come through Isaac. And since Isaac wasn't married, at least not at that point, and didn't have any children at that time, Abraham therefore knew that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead to fulfill his promise. Now, here is a good example of someone who lived and walked in God's truth. Hebrews tells us that Abraham and others saw the promises of God afar off. Because they saw those promises and they beheld those promises, they held on to those promises, it determined how they were to live in their time. And that was the case with Abraham. How about Joseph? He believed in the resurrection of the body. Why was Joseph so concerned that his bones be returned to the land of Israel? Well, he wanted his bones to be taken to the land of Israel because he, that is Joseph, wanted to be raised from the dead in Israel. The Bible says, Later on, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under a solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you. This is what Joseph said. God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here and take them with you. And so thus... Moses did that. So even Joseph believed in the resurrection. And he wanted that body of his firmly planted in a place that would be the right place. David, later on, 
also believed in the resurrection. He said, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also re will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In other words, he knew that he personally would not experience corruption. Now, we know the body does experience corruption. It decays, right? Once it's in the grave, it's just the body that's in the grave. When David died, he wasn't in the grave. Just his body. So therefore, he did not see corruption. So there's hope for the flesh, that is the body, as well as the soul. Going into the New Testament, Peter now comments on what David had earlier said. He said, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So the flesh or the body of Jesus was not destroyed. And so that was an Old Testament prophecy that was given through David that the body of Jesus would not see decay, and it did not. Because he did not have a sinful body. He had a sinless body. So his body was raised up. And David believed that if God could raise Jesus, God could raise him. So therefore, he had hope. How about Isaiah? Isaiah said, Your dead men shall live together with my dead body, and they shall rise up. Oh, yes, how glorious that will be. Praise the Lord. Do I get a praise the Lord out here? Lord. Amen. God can't get much plainer than this is what he has said. The dead will live, and the dead will be raised. So, one of the Old Testament minor prophets, Hosea, had this to say about the resurrection. He said, should I ransom them from the grave? Should I redeem them from death? O oh, death, bring forth your terrors, all your threats. O oh, grave, bring forth your plagues, for I will not relent. See, he was determined. The grave could just come and throw all kinds of stuff against him, but he wasn't going to allow that to, to affect him, not in the least. It is the Lord that defeats the power of the grave and brings victory for the body. Now, the soul and the spirit, what happens when we die? They go directly to heaven. Or if you're an unbeliever, go directly to hell, but not the grave. For instance, years ago, my wife's father, in one of his films, he talked about the difference between the soul and the body. Now he said, let's say you come to me and you cut off my hand. That's not me. You cut off my arm. You still have it gotten to me. In fact, you cut off everything, and, you know, you still haven't gotten to me. Now, if you keep whittling away, he said, you'll eventually get to me. But, you see, our soul, in fact, the Word of God tells us we're made of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, right? It's the body that goes to the grave. The soul and spirit go to be with Jesus. And so we have to understand that. What you're seeing up here is just the house I live in. It's not me. It's just the house I live in. And I'm looking at all of you, and I just see your house, your houses as well. In fact, later on, Peter will talk about the fact that we live in tents. Paul said, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This past week, Marilyn and I have had two close friends that the Lord has taken home as a result of cancer. Their body is going to be buried. But they're no longer here. They're with Jesus. They'll no longer suffer death of any kind. They'll never be faced with sin and the effects of sin ever again. Why? Jesus gives us the victory over the grave. Going back to the Old Testament, look at Daniel. Daniel believed in the resurrection of the body. Daniel said, and many of them, that is Old Testament saints, sleep in the dust of the earth, and they shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we're told, it is the body that sleeps in the dust of the earth, 
and will wake up and one day be raised. So the soul and the spirit are conscious and they're either going to be in heaven or in hell. In the New Testament, you read about, you know, Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man was in uh, Hades and he was very much aware of his situation and his surroundings. He had a very conscious awareness of what, where he was at and what was happening to him. Jesus, he believed in the resurrection of the body. There in John chapter 5, he said these words, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in that while all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So the body comes out of the grave. Matthew believed in the resurrection of the body because when Jesus died upon that cross, we're told, and only Matthew records this, that the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, coming out of the grave, graves after his resurrection, and they went into the holy city and he appeared to, men, to many. So wouldn't you have loved to have seen a video of this? I, would, I hope the Lord has a way of playing that back one day. I would like to see the, the mouths of people as they saw, hey, there's, there's Uncle Harry. I can't believe he's walking on the streets here in Jerusalem. Amazing. Seeing all that, is it no wonder that multitudes got saved some 50 days later? Graves were open, bodies arose, bodies came out of the graves, bodies went into the holy city of Jerusalem, bodies appeared to many, literally happened. I'm thinking if a few dead bodies knocked on the door of La Puente, maybe multitudes would get saved. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Paul believed in the resurrection of the body. That great chapter, here's a chapter you need to love. Where's that resurrection chapter at? Do you know where it's at? Hmm? 1 Corinthians 15. That's a chapter you got to love. Paul said, concerning Jesus, that he, Jesus, was seen by Cephas, who was Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. They're still alive. But some have fallen asleep. They've died. After that, he was seen by James, and then all of the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. We're going to see more about James here in just a little bit. Now this James was affected by the resurrection of Jesus. Who was this James? Well, Jesus had a half-brother by the name of James. Initially, he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That is, before Jesus was raised from the dead. But seeing is believing. James got saved and became a great leader of the church and wrote the epistle of James. So we don't believe the skeptics because we have the evidence. Skeptics say we can't believe these eyewitness reports because they only come from believers. Not so. James was an unbeliever who didn't expect Jesus to be raised from the dead. But thereafter, he lived many years confessing that he did believe. So what if the skeptics were right? Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul presents this amazing argument. He says, if the skeptics are right, then Christ is not risen. Our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Why believe? The disciples actually lied when they told the story about Jesus rising from the dead. Therefore, that being so, we're still in our sins. And those who have died, deceased believers, have now perished. And we have no hope, but praise be to God, Jesus was raised. I mean, Paul just stacks upon evidence, upon evidence, upon evidence, right? It's undeniable. All these things are fact after fact after fact. So if the dead aren't raised, scriptures are therefore wrong. Therefore, Elijah didn't raise the widow's son, 1 Kings 17. Jesus did not raise Lazarus and others. Peter didn't raise Dorcas or Tabitha there in Acts chapter 9. 
Paul didn't raise that young man that, you know, fell out of the upstory, upstairs window. And Jesus was not raised according to what we read in Luke chapter 24. Now, if Jesus wasn't raised, well, but the scriptures, if he wasn't raised, then the scriptures are all wrong. We might as well pack up our goods and go home. We have no point in going on, right? If the dead aren't raised, Paul said we need to make some changes. Therefore, we need to stop putting people under the water during baptism, which we'll be doing in a couple of weeks. So we don't raise people up out of the water. We just hold them down if they don't believe, right? And we just stop serving God. We don't continue to attend church. We don't give an offering. We don't teach. We just eat, drink, and be merry. Because there's no judgment. There's no future rewards. There's no future reunion. But numerous passage talk about what happens after death. They we're told in the word of God that the soul of every human being survives death and goes in what probably is a disembodied state for a while. Now, the Bible doesn't talk very much, hardly at all, about that transition. But we conclude that there is that transitional phase. The Lord told Abraham that he would be gathered to his people. The body returns to dust. The soul is gathered to a person's loved ones. God said Abraham was going to a place of peace. Jesus called that place Abraham's bosom. You read about it there in Luke chapter 16. A place of conscious bliss, which is where Lazarus was at. And gathered to implies a get-together of spirits, not merely disintegration of the body, as if he was going to the grave. When Jacob died there in Genesis 49, he was still in bed. His body was still in bed. Not yet buried, but he died. Jacob was no longer there. His body was, but he wasn't. How about the death of Rachel? We're told in Genesis 35, verse 18, so it was as her soul was departing, for she died. The implication being her soul was leaving her body at the time of death to go somewhere else. David said, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol or Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. And in your presence after the resurrection is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So here we are told that the soul must be in some conscious bliss before being reunited with the body for it to have eternal bliss in its presence after death. Now we talked about the rapture a couple of weeks ago. And we're, we're told in various places that at the time of the rapture, it's when we'll receive those new bodies, the Church of Jesus Christ. But going on further after death, recall that Jesus said this. He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the living, or sorry, the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And since Abraham was not yet resurrected, but was said to be living, Jesus must have meant that his soul was alive between death and the resurrection. Now, after a bit, we'll see that uh, Abraham and other Old Testament saints will not be resurrected and receive their resurrected bodies until Jesus comes back the second time. But Dave, Abraham was very much alive. Other passages say the same thing. The rich man in Lazarus, the thief on the cross, he would be in paradise, but his body would be in the grave. In fact, the moment he died, his body was still on the cross. We're told in John 19 that when Jesus died, he gave up his spirit. His body remained upon the cross. Stephen, when he was being stoned, when he died, he said to the Lord, Lord, receive my spirit. His body just crumpled there on the ground. Plus, we have countless other recipes, references. references. John would write, I saw the souls who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God. Now these people died. They were beheaded. And so they were no longer alive in those bodies. Their bodies were just headless bodies. So these individuals had died a terrible physical death, but their souls are in heaven in a conscious disembodied state. 
going to the other side of things, the area of unbelievers, and the prince of the unbelievers, of course, is Satan himself. Eventually, when Satan is captured and thrown into the lake of fire, we're told, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet. Sorry, this is, this is the Antichrist, and not the Satan himself. The Antichrist. When the, when the Antichrist was captured, and with him the false prophet, then these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with a brimstone. Now we come to the devil. The devil who deceived the people on the earth was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, are. They're very much alive. And they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. A very conscious awareness of where they were at and of their misery. So the Bible teaches that between death and the resurrection, the human soul or spirit survives consciously apart from the body. This is neither a state of annihilation nor a state of unconscious sleep. This is the eternal state of conscious bliss for the saved and the conscious anguish for the lost. So the body goes to sleep or to a state of rest waiting for a future resurrection. The Bible uses the term sleep interesting, implying a temporary state. For instance, we habitually go to sleep in order to rest the body. But then we awake at a future time. So too the body will be awakened at a future time and be reunited with the soul and taken to one of two destinations. For us as believers, death is a temporary cessation of bodily life and a separation of the soul from the body. When a believer dies, though his or her physical body remains on the earth and is buried, at the moment of death, the soul or the spirit goes immediately into the presence of God with rejoicing. Paul wrote to the Corinthians by saying these in 1st and 2nd Corinthians chapter 5. We are confident. We're sure. We're well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Notice. Absent from what? The body, right? We're absent from the body but present with the Lord. He goes on to say at the beginning of that chapter, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, and certainly we do, and I do more of that every day, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Recall that when Lazarus died, Jesus said to his disciples that Lazarus was asleep. There in John chapter 11, verse 11, we're told these things he said, and after that he said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. What the disciples thought. <laughs> He's just now taking a nap. That's all there is. Because they said to Jesus, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought he was just speaking about taking rest or sleeping. But Jesus then went on to explain, Lazarus is dead. Going back to the believer's resurrection. You can be so thankful to the Lord that he has placed you in this time and a part of this dispensation, which we call the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. The church is made up of a unique dispensation of believers that is distinct from all other believers in any other age. And as such, God has a plan that will one day usher all faithful church believers to heaven. This was made possible again by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Going back to that great chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming, that is the rapture. So we are told that Christ is the firstfruits. He was the first to rise. Then secondly, those who are in Christ, that is the church believers, will then rise. And we have this awesome passage that we've all come to love, perhaps, there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul says, But I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. There's that word sleep again. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are 
asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with his shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, therefore comfort one another with these words. So here we're told that church believers will receive their resurrection bodies at the time of the rapture. This is your proof text right here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. At the moment of the rapture, all believers, whether dead or alive at that particular time, will receive their resurrected or glorified bodies. Now what about the believer's resurrection body? The believer's body will have several notable characteristics. It will be like Christ's body. We're told in Philippians 3.21, Paul said, who will transform our lowly, or these earthly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious bodies. So we study the body of Jesus after his resurrection, and we'll get some clue as to what our future resurrection body will be like. Christ's body that arose was the same as the one before. He had feet, he had flesh, he had bones, he ate food, and so forth. So, we get to eat, guys. I don't know if it's going to be ice cream Sundays or not, but we'll get to eat because Jesus ate. Moreover, he said, Behold, my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So we'll have bodies that could be touched. Furthermore, the believer's body will be material. We're told that there will be a resurrection from among the dead. And since only physical bodies are buried, the resurrection will be of the physical body that died. There in Luke 24, Jesus said, then, I'm uh, sorry, the angel said to the people at the tomb, he said, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, the angel said to them, why do you seek the living from among the dead? So Jesus was not in that tomb. Now, he, they, they were in a graveyard, but Jesus was not there. Secondly, the body raised is one that was sown in death. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul goes on to say, so also was the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. We live in corruptible bodies, bodies that will one day decay and die. In fact, I'm in the process of really, really reaching that point <laughs> rather quickly now. So the believer's resurrection body is still future. Thirdly, Paul says, rather than replacing the mortal body, the immortal resurrection body is put on over it, like putting on a suit of clothes. He says, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up into victory. So one day we all get a new wardrobe, and it will never wear out. That's going to be glorious. I'll never have to go shopping again for clothes. Right? I'll have a permanent body that will never wear out. Finally, John tells us, Beloved, now we are all children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he, he Jesus, is revealed that there at the rapture, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, we shall be like him. What was Jesus like after he rose from the dead? Well, we just saw he had a, somewhat of a physical body, right? He was able to eat and so forth like that. So, guys, after the resurrection, we're going to still be able to feast, right? Awesome. Now, what does the Word of God tell us about the resurrection body of Jesus? Well, he was flesh and bone. There in Luke 24, verse 39, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you now see. I have. So, we'll have physical bodies. He was able to eat. So we're told that they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. So we'll be able to eat. Wow. Also, with that resurrection body, he was not limited by this physical world. There in John chapter 20, we're told these. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, 
Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. No need for a door or window. He just came right on in. I think the real miracle there in that upper room experience was not so much that Jesus could go through a wall or door, but was the fact that the disciples, with their physical earthly eyes, could see him. Jesus had no spatial earthly limitation. What do I mean by that? He was able to transport himself quickly over distances. Because there in John chapter 21, after Jesus, we're told, showed himself to the disciples, this time he was in the Sea of Siberias, up north, in the area of Galilee. And this way he showed himself to them. How did he get there? I don't think you would find him riding a camel or walking. He was instantly there. I mean, when you think about the resurrection, there in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended up, I mean, that was pretty amazing, right? If he could go up like that, I think he could go from wherever he was at there in Jerusalem to Galilee, no problem. In fact, we're told there in Acts 1.9, Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So, what does that mean for us? We will have an amazing transportation system. There in Revelation 3.5, we're told, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Boy, we get a new wardrobe. How glorious it will be. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And so we'll be given new white garments. Then we go to the far end of the book of Revelation, chapter 19, and we're up on these stallions or mounts, and we come back with Jesus. That's going to be an interesting sight, isn't it? We come back from him, from those heavenly dwelling places to this earth, and we're going to be on white horses. Have all of you had an opportunity to ride a horse? If you haven't, maybe we want to get some practice in, okay? The believer's body, we're told, will be immortal. More than just a physical body, the believer's body will be supernatural and spiritually powered or spirit-dominated. We were born with a body that was fleshly dominated. Secondly, the body raised is the one that will be sown in death, according to 1 Corinthians 15.42. Thirdly, rather than replacing the mortal body, the immortal resurrection body is put on over it. It's like putting on a new set of clothes, a set of suit of clothes. Finally, John tells us, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So you get your Bible down. What was Jesus like after the resurrection? And we're told that we'll be like him. Not limited to distance or space, or time for that matter. It's going to be an amazing transformation. And the change will not be from a material body, but from a perishable physical body to an imperishable physical body. A body that will never wear out and die. Now there are other resurrections recorded in the scriptures. We're told in the Old Testament saints will be resurrected at Christ's second coming. We're told in Daniel chapter 12, at that time Michael, the archangel, shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of their people. And there shall be a time of trouble, that is tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, the Jews, your people, shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Old Testament saints, they'll be resurrected after uh, Jesus comes back. Now, why will Old Testament saints be resurrected at the second coming? The distinction is made between the church believers and the Old Testament saints, and this should make us all very thankful that we live in this dispensation that is this age of the church. Those who are church believers are saved after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, atonement was available at the time of salvation, and they are then placed into the body of Christ as you and I, believers. But this was not possible with Old Testament saints who had died because they were never in Christ. You see, when they died was before Jesus came and died and was able to atone for their sins. So they will have their resurrection at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus comes back. Now there are other resurrections. 
The tribulation saints, those who die during that seven-year period, they will be resurrected at Christ's second coming. John writes, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads upon their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there are several resurrections that the Bible teaches. This one here would be for those who died during that tribulation period. Some other resurrections, well, all unbelievers will be resurrected when? After the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, after the millennium. Because John would write there in Revelation chapter 20, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. John continues, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea therefore also gave up its dead that were in it. So all these resurrections, so there's several of them that are recorded in the scriptures. The first resurrection, which is Jesus Christ. He was the first to rise from the dead. Shortly after, there were a few Old Testament saints, as, we told, as we're told in the Gospel of Matthew, who walked the streets of Jerusalem. They were resurrected. Before the tribulation, you and I, who are part of the church of Jesus Christ, will be raptured and taken to heaven. We'll be resurrected. Third, next, next was uh, in the middle of the tribulation, there's going to be two witnesses recorded there in Revelation chapter 11 who will also be raptured and taken to heaven. And at the time of Jacob's trouble, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected. That will be uh, at, the, <clears throat> at the beginning of the millennial kingdom and they will be going, they'll be able to go into the kingdom and reign. And then, beginning of the millennial kingdom, there will be tribulation martyrs, which we just read about there in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. These tribulation martyrs will be resurrected so that they can rule and reign with Jesus Christ during that period of time. And lastly, at the end of that 1,000 year reign, the unbelieving dead will be resurrected. However, they won't be going into a period of reigning with Jesus, they'll be confined to hell forever. They'll be sentenced in their judgment, and off they will go, the great white throne judgment. It's one of the most, the resurrection is one of the most important doctrines of the Bible. And there are many verses in the Bible about the resurrection of the dead that some say the person who doesn't believe in the resurrection of the dead doesn't believe the Bible and may not be saved. Do you realize you have to believe in the resurrection to be saved? According to Romans 10, 9. So, it's an important doctrine, is it not? So, Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming back soon. I mean, all the signs point to that. Do they not? We're there. I mean, if you were to draw a timeline of the age of the church and what the Bible talks about concerning that timeline, we have to realize that we're close to being there, right? Already, the stage is being sent for those final days. So, we're almost there. Any questions? <clears throat>